Right, so what we really have to talk about is we have to talk about our complete examination because going through this examination is what is going to be our foundation to determine what type of splint do we need to make. What's going on in the stomatic anapic system that is making this patient need a splint therapy? And then we have to figure out, are we treating joint or are we treating muscle or are we treating both? Because that's going to lead us to very different conclusions and a different appropriate treatment when it comes to our splint design. And the way we figure that out is by performing this complete examination. So how does this relate to your splint or your successful night guard making? This has everything to do. This is what every dentist is missing that gets frustrated with splints. Everybody gets frustrated, but they're not getting the results that they want. It's frustrating. They're having to over adjust them. The patients aren't, it's not working. Why is this splint not working? All of it gets funneled back down to what it is that we're going to be talking about over the next hour or two. Because the complete examination allows us to make the differential diagnosis. Are we dealing with an extracapsular issue? Are we dealing with an intracapsular issue? Or quite possibly, are we dealing with something else that maybe we need to get our medical friends involved with us, right? So are we dealing with an occlusal muscular problem or parafunction? extracapsular. Are we dealing with a lateral pull disc issue, a medial pull disc issue, or degenerative joint disease, which is an intracapsular problem? And I'm going to go through exactly all of these for you. In a little while, I'm going to make sure I fully explain to you guys how the anatomy of the joint works, how the joint functions, and when the joint's not functioning correctly, what is that telling us, and how does this lead us to decide what is the appropriate splint therapy? So when we make this differential diagnosis, the good news is that there are only two categories of splints that we can deal with. The first one, first category is permissive splints. And in a permissive splint, it give, is giving the mandible permission, just like it sounds. The mandible is allowed to freely move against a flat, smooth surface, and there are no deflective inclines which prevent the condyles from seeding. The second category of splint is directive splints. Directive splints do just that. They direct the mandible into a predetermined position, which in turn does the same to the condyles, right? So whatever we do to the mandible when it comes to an anterior posterior positioning, it's going to do the same thing to the condyles. So the splint positions the condyles out of the fossa and down the articular eminence. But here's the deal, and this is, we already kind of touched on this with Raj. This is the best advice that you're gonna get from this lecture. And this is the most important thing that you can do is that anytime you hand a patient a piece of plastic, you are telling them that this is the start of treatment, not the end of treatment. And when I start to have a discussion about splint therapy with a patient, Ultimately, the discussion that we're going to have is absolutely going to talk about what we do after splint therapy, and the patient is also going to be educated about what they should experience during splint therapy so that they know what the endpoint of splint therapy is going to be, and when we reach that endpoint, what's going to happen after that. So the patient completely understands what it is that we're getting into, what their role in success is going to be, and also what their role in success is going to be with regard to fixing the problem that got them to the point that they need to work on their teeth or that they, that they ended up with the splint, right? And now we start getting into things that go beyond insurance. And so one of the things that we're going to spend time on today as we talk about this process of what we call co-diagnosis and the complete examination, these are the keys to being able to move beyond the effect that insurance has in your ability to treat your patients and the effect that insurance has in the profitability of your practice. Because ultimately, if we can make sure that we give our patients enough information to be educated to where they can choose to do what's best for themselves, that is when insurance no longer is a factor. Because inherently, everybody wants to take the best care of themselves possible but the reality is that most of our patients have never been given the opportunity to choose that. 
because they've only been given the opportunity to choose, well, what's insurance going to pay for? Or what's the worst problem in my mouth? And how can we solve this problem to where insurance is going to pay for it, or I have to pay the least amount possible to allow this to be accomplished? You know, all of these things that we're talking about all comes from Dr. Dawson. And, you know, as we move forward and we start to really get into the important components of this lecture, I want to just make sure that I give credit to Dr. Dawson and give credit to Dr. Cranham, our clinical director. You know, these guys have been two of the most important people in my life. And, you know, I've learned from a lot of people over the years. Um, you know, Henry Grimian was one of them that we talked about in the beginning of this lecture. And uh, Dr. Dawson, um, Dr. Cranham, Frank Spear, all of these people have been such an influence. And none of this is original stuff that I've discovered myself or I'm presenting for the first time to other people. These are all concepts that I have been lucky enough to learn from the people that have been important and have mentored me along the way. And, you know, we lost Dr. Dawson last year and, uh, you know, losing him was really just um, a devastating thing for our profession because, you know, so many of the things that we do take for granted as being common knowledge, a lot of these things were proved to be true by Dr. Dawson. And he spent a lot of time early on in his career being ostracized for staying true to anatomical truths and how these anatomical truths relate to functional truths. And a lot of these things weren't necessarily accepted right away. So getting to know Pete and spending time with Pete on a personal basis was one of the most gratifying things in my life. And uh, I'm so thankful to have had the opportunity to spend the time that I have with Pete and to have been uh, guided by his knowledge over time. You know, being able to lecture for the Dawson Academy has opened up so many different doors for me to help people around the world. You know, I've had the privilege of routinely lecturing in Poland, in China, in Japan, in Canada, in Germany, really all over the place. And the thing that I'll tell you from going and learning and, and teaching dentists all over the world is that we all have the same problems. That whatever country I go to, dentists are challenges in dealing with patients is common, no matter what language we speak or what time zone we're in or what it is that we eat or consider to be yummy food. So when we go into this, what I want you to know is that eventually we're going to get to the point to where you're going to learn what type of appliance to make and when and why. And so if you look at this patient here, you know, these before and after pictures were a long time coming, you know, from the start of treatment to the end of treatment, you know, a case like this can sometimes take a year and a half or sometimes two years to achieve. And in the end game, we ended up making two different appliances for this patient based on what we were trying to overcome and our challenges were at the various stages of health and occlusal and functional stability. And all of this, as we were talking about, goes back to what our patients are experiencing. So this patient, you know, she was having a lot of red on this summary page, a lot of problems with headaches, jaw function, clenching and grinding, muscle palpation problems, clicking and popping joints, you know, she had problems with having pain in both sides of her muscles, primarily on her right side, having problem getting locked in the daytime, locked shut at nighttime, not violently, but still kind of having resistance to normal function within her joints. And so all of these things that we're going to talk about, which lead us to being able to determine the appropriate therapy, has everything to do with our, our muscle palpation, our examining of the joint listening to the joints as we're gonna learn about in just a minute, our occlusal examination, asking our questions about our requirements of occlusal stability. And all of these start with our ability to go in here and diagnose things from the joint level. Because again, the first thing that we always have to look at is are the temporomandibular joints, are they stable, are they healthy, and can they accept maximum load testing? Because most of the time when we're creating a splint for a patient, what are we trying to treat? Most of the time for our patients, we're trying to treat problems related to their temporomandibular joints. And so let's go in here and let's really spend some time understanding 
the temporomandibular joints and understanding how this relates to our patients when they have temporomandibular dysfunction.